Anyway, it's um, good to be here. And as we can see, we will be hearing of Jesus and those with lots. And as we referred to last week, that's all of us. We live in the West. We live in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. We live in Bondi. And everywhere we look, we're surrounded by lots. Um, probably most of us have a well above what the average is. Maybe some of us have well above average what is normal for an Australian. So um, we have lots. But if you're like me, you live in the eastern suburbs and you look around and the comparison is large. I remember my first experience with someone who was really wealthy, not just Bondi wealthy, but wealthy wealthy. <laughs> like I, I'm used to walking to someone's home and going, okay, this is the four or five million dollar house. That's the normal around here. Crazy, crazy part of the world we live in. The first time I walked into a house, which was not down the bottom of Bondi, but you had to drive up the hill and you had the view of the city and also the view. And they had like three or four parking spaces. And you went in and it was space and expanse and fine art on the walls and terracotta sort of thing that was in style at the time. And walked in onto the pool with little cacti all around it. There were bar fridges everywhere. When the first time I'd met a place where I'd met a family who obviously had generational wealth, wealth that had been passed down from family to family, and they'd leveraged that and they had done well. And I was standing in a house which would probably sell for around 25 which is still just crazy. It was impressive. I'm walking there and I go, oh, I wouldn't be able to find this actually. It's pretty really nice. Look at the space. At that time, a two bedroom unit going, oh, I can have one kid there, one kid there. Separate them, be pretty quiet. I can even have my own room. But the thing is, I'm sitting there and I was, like, I was impressed. And we all would have been impressed. And I was excited just to be a part of it. Um, and there was that little bit of longing. Um, this was maybe a little bit more of my story. But in the interactions, I met the people who lived there, and it's amazing how we do this sometimes when we meet people with lots. Is I labeled these, this family, I labeled this person as being incredibly wealthy, which they were. But in my mind, they became not just John who was wealthy, they became wealthy. It wasn't just a characteristic of their life, it became their identity of how I knew them and how I related to them. In some way, I elevated them above myself to get a distance, which created a difficulty in actually connecting heart to heart. I remember another time um, when I was down at North Bondi and sitting on the grass, this is around 10 years ago now, there were four of us. You might remember this case. And there was another couple there. And we were discussing whether we're going to move to Bondi to help with missions. Are we going to leave where we were to this crazy place this glossy place, this beautiful place called Bondi. And we're sitting there and having a chat with this other couple. And they're like, yeah, we want to come. We'll see the need. We want to be part of this. And out of nowhere, this thing on the grass, around 20 people turned up and surrounded us and sat right next to us on either side. And they were all in their swimmers. They were all incredibly beautiful. It was like a bus turned up and unloaded a bunch of bottles. And they sat around us. They were in the peak of their physical like, form. They worked in the gym hard. They were tan. They were beautiful. They knew it. They were confident. And we just changed. We just surrounded. We're sitting there. And we just changed. We, we stopped talking. You know, we just sort of like, and, but deep down, something happened again. We didn't see these people as people. These people were beautiful people, not who Jane, who is, happens to be beautiful. And chatting to my friend, I remember afterwards, I go, yeah, and she goes, I suddenly felt really, really insecure. I felt like I didn't belong here anymore. I actually don't want to come to Bondo now. I don't belong here because these people are too beautiful. And I was like, whoa, there was insecurity. There was intimidation. There was like, I don't belong. Just because these people happen to be beautiful. I'm sure they were flaunting it a little bit. But that's what lost with you. I remember another time of an interaction of people of at a party and there was a, a celebrity who was going to come. It was a small party. It was around 18 of us. And there was a guy who was a professional AFL player who was going to come, which some of us know. And the guys were all excited. You know, it's just like, coming. And I watched as we were all hanging around, chatting, laughing. And I know these guys very well who were at the party. And as soon as this guy turned up, you get a sense of excitement. The guys. They're like getting a little giddy, they're getting excited. Like, and I watched the stories that we were telling 
all of them because they all use stories over and over again in the same ones as what guys do. But they were just exaggerating at the next level. Like, that's not true. I know the real story. But they were doing this. They wanted to get this guy's approval. They wanted this guy to be in their inner core. And I even saw a mate, he was sort of like in a subtle bit of a circle. He's like edging out his mate so he can get more attention. And I was like, this guy just happens to be able to keep a football very well. This guy who is a celebrity did it. We elevated into a status which distanced, distanced him from us, which actually decreased our ability to relate to him as another human being. It's funny how this happens in these interactions of wealth or beauty or just people that have a loss in whatever thing. Sometimes we get intimidated. Sometimes we get insecure. Sometimes we get giddy and we just want to be part of it. But all of it is those things that we see in them and we don't make, we don't know where it comes from. We just want it in our lives a little bit too much, but we can't see past it. And as Kaz said so beautifully before, we need, like Jesus, to be able to see past those things and see people as people, not as wealthy, as beautiful, as whatever. Because all people, whether they're wealthy or whether they're good looking or whether they're rich or whether they've got the lots, are actually just humans made in the image of God, in need of God's grace. They have their own battles. They just may look very different to us. And one thing I did this week, I just picked up my Bible and I just flipped through. I just go, Jesus, and interacting with people with lots. And I just flipped through and I was just looking for every interaction with people who have lots. And I remember we, I did look at the rich young ruler. As mentioned before, and think of that rich, wealthy, he's young, so he's probably looking good, and he's a ruler, he's got power. So all three of three points. And I love the verse in Mark 10 21. We often skip over it. We didn't see Jesus trying to like leverage the power from this guy. We didn't see Jesus trying to do a bit of fundraising for this. We saw Jesus, and it says his little thing, and it just said, Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is sort past all the titles and the boxes that other people may throw into person that put him and loved him. And from there, challenged him to live a better life. Martin spoke last week of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Jesus saw past the wealth and saw past even the corruption and the hurt and the traitorship of him and just saw it and invited him to lunch. Yeah. When Jesus interacted with the religious leaders and the civil leaders, he didn't get intimidated. He didn't try and network. He didn't try and play the game and jockey around. He was just himself. When I saw Jesus interacting with these people who had lots, I saw the exact same Jesus that I see interacting with those who had lots. Same Jesus who interacted with a leper or a widow or a small child was the exact same Jesus who was interacting with someone with power. He didn't change. He was being used. How often do we change? And so often I see people helping those who have a lower status, but they do so out of like a project mentality or even out of a bit of, bit of consciousness. Or often I see people interacting with those who are above them in the socioeconomic scale and they try to impress or they're intimidated. When I look at Jesus, I saw someone who was who was himself, who knew who he was in the Father and could therefore love and serve. It's actually sad that God's church hasn't always walked in the same way as Jesus in these matters. God's church has got caught up with the whole pecking order of people that have more are better off, people have less, maybe need a bit of help. Um, there's actually a thing going through the world at the moment, and they call it, um, they label it um, green room Christianity. Green rooms where you go, like if you're going on TV, you go in the green room first, get ready, get your hair, makeup done, you hang out, wait, 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 and then you come out and you do your performance. And in lots of churches around the globe, have a green room now. And what do they do? The pastors and the worship pastors and those who are performing up front sit in the green room and they get ready. And often they're sitting with people that they want to sit with. They're sitting with their buddies. They're sitting with their friends. They're sitting with the people on their inner sanctum. The people often who are on a similar level of status. And they come out and they do their ministry and it can be great ministry. It can be beautiful ministry. And then what often happens is they then just come back into the green room and they spend no time interacting with anyone. And no wonder in the church we see scandal and we see secret lives 
and we see humanness, and we see perception. Not everywhere, but somewhere. I spent some time in a church in Taiwan, and this church was full of very impressive people. It was in Taiwan, and with Taipei, sorry, it was in the top of Taipei 101, which is a really tall building, the tallest building in Taipei. And in that is where all the banks had their headquarters and stuff like that. And this church was full of those impressive people. I met two heads of banks. At the time, I met a person that sung and had songs in the, the equivalent of the top 40. And all these people were well networked, lots of cash. They had lots. But they met in the top of this building deliberately so that other people couldn't come. Um, reasons behind it, for good or for bad, and as I've, I've thought about this, I don't know if this is good or bad, is they were so fed up with other people coming into their church gatherings and trying to leverage their relationships through business deals while they're trying to focus on the message, trying to get autographs. They had paparazzi coming into their gatherings, taking snapshots of people in, like heads of banks seeing with a microphone carrier style the front of the church, and then the next day it'll be in the paper. And so they made the choice to sort of separate because, and these people who were coming in were often other Christians. So this church had to make drastic decisions all because of these levels. And, so and the reason I'm going into this, we have a society which has socioeconomic levels. I've walked past, I think a few of us went past a, a pub, a restaurant the other day, and we asked, have you got any seats? And the guy just looked at us and said no. And then we looked in and it was empty. So obviously, he looked at us and just goes, no, nah, not you guys. So we went on to the next one. I'll walk the rest of it next time. Wait till you're there. You'll have to down there and sign it. But um, we were, we were coming straight from news, but we weren't well dressed. <laughs> Fair enough. But it was just like, obviously, you know, when the bouncer gives that little look at this guy, you know, it happens. This, the passage we're looking at is from 1 Corinthians. Churches in Corinth, Greek culture everywhere. And socioeconomic levels are probably more heightened there than they are now. They're masters and they're slaves. There is favoritism expected for those that have lots. Um, even the law courts would favor those who have more. The law courts, we think law courts is all about who's right and wrong. In this stage, the law courts were based on who had the most. Um, and so if you had more, you would win because you'd pay a bribe. And that was how the law courts were. It's actually the Christian standing of. The image of God and fairness, which does actually change the law profession with inequality. So the law thing was like you know someone, you give them some money, and it'll be ruled in your favor. So if you had a lot, you would always win. If you had not much, you would always lose. And that's why actually Paul says Christians shouldn't take their brothers and sisters to court because it's not fair, it's all based on how much money and leverage you have got. So this crazy culture of socioeconomic levels. But also, most of the Christians in this church came from a pagan background, Greek thing. So they were used to having big meals, big festivals. Imagine a big table with food, with wine. You may picture it from TV. And they would be toast to various gods. And then they would often have the meal. And then after the meal, they would, they would have what's called a wine party. As you imagine what that is, is where you just dance and drink and get drunk. And that was commonplace in this town. And so we have this new church of new believers who have come to faith in this context, and they're a small little church, and obviously they're having a few difficulties. They're having a few problems with division. And so we can see up verse 17, Paul writes to this church, and his brutal goes, for your meetings do more harm than good. It's a scathing review. It's, a, it's better for you not even to gather. It's a travesty of what you're doing. Stop it. And why? Straight in the next verse, one of the line notes talks about because you have divisions amongst you. Why is it just so wrong what they're doing? It's because this church is divided and it's divided along socioeconomic levels. And it's hard to picture what's going on here because it's not exactly clear. We have to sort of glean stuff from different things. But you can imagine this as a church. Don't think church building because they don't have church buildings yet. So they're meeting in a home. And whose house they're meeting in, they're probably meeting in one of the wealthier members' house. Probably because it's bigger and it's going to be easier for us to have. And if you know much about archaeology in these days, the houses are often two levels. And the way they're designed is upstairs, there's like a kitchen area or the main eating area, but you can only fit around 12 to 20, depending on how big the house is. And the church is bigger than that. 
And so you imagine this church. You can even picture it here. You have a church and up top here, there'll be room for 12 people, say. There'll be a big table. And everyone else, there'll be a bit of space for you down here. A lot of it. Maybe in the courtyard, maybe in the atrium, maybe even outside. So you have this church where some people are here eating and then others are down here eating. And we can see later on, it's in verse, um, I'll point it out, I'll show you later on. But it seems like these people are coming to church earlier and they're starting without everyone else. There's no weekends yet. So there's not like people having weekends and that. So most of the people who are of lower status, it seems like you're at your jobs, you're working hard, you're selling things in the marketplace. And you're doing your best to get to this person's house to gather as God's people and you turn up. And the wealthy people, probably with his mates, sort of like the mates, you're the patron of the house, you're why you're in the same place sit there, have already started. They've eaten most of the food, they've drunk all the wine to the point where they're probably drunk, and there's nothing left. Or there are drinks left, or there is really simple food left because there's still going in. It's pretty a pretty horrible picture of complete division over socioeconomic status. To the point where these people who are of the lower thing are leaving hungry, all these people are. The problem is this is completely normal in Greek culture. This is like this, this is what you call a party. This is how it works. This is how it's in the slaves would sit out there, people in there. This was really normal. And what does Paul say? You do more harm than good. And in verse 22, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not. And so what does Paul do this? He's speaking to this church on radical division over how much people have. He points it out. And then he does what in my point is unusual. He goes to these words, which don't agree on now. He goes to the language of the Lord's Supper. Which at this stage would have been an oral tradition. He was not Christian yet. And so it would have been an oral thing. He goes to the words of Jesus when the Lord, the Passover meal, the night before he's betrayed. And we bring these words most weeks at the Lord's Supper. And so we bring these words in here. And Paul reminds them of what you're doing. He's like, what you're doing when you gather together as church is not a normal dinner party. Now, you're not just doing a normal dinner thing. You're not just having friends over and feasting and laughing and dancing, even though you can do that. You're actually also partaking in the Lord's Supper. And as you're partaking in the Lord's Supper, you're doing this in remembrance of what and what he did. The bread, which we actually have up there, representing his body broken. The cup, which is representing the new covenant. Notice it doesn't actually say the blood. It's not the, the, in this version, it's not the Bread and the wine. It's actually the bread and the cup. And the cup representing the new covenant. And why the new covenant? Because the covenant is talking about the institution of the church. God created for himself a people. And he also says we need to be careful. It's not an all party because in doing this, it says there was in the bottom verse, we are proclaiming the Lord's death. So we are remembering and we are also proclaiming and declaring and representing the gospel. That through his death, He's instituted himself for a people, a church. A body where he's ahead and a body where all people are welcome. And so when we do this Lord's Supper, we are obviously doing it tonight. We don't walk to this table with what we have to bring. We don't walk up to the table with our wealth. And that's why we get to eat. We don't walk up to the table with us image we may happen to have or the style that we have or whatever. We don't come up with the power of the success or even the failure and the opposite of those. We come up to the table because of what Jesus has done with his body broken on the cross, which we remember in the Lord's Supper. And as we do it, each one of us eats the same food. Each one of us, no matter what we have, drink the same wine or cordial, doesn't matter, it's a choice I treat the reasons not one's better than the other, even though I do enjoy one more than the other. Because why? Because we're all children of God, no matter what our worth, made in the image on the journey to be transformed more and more into that. And so go to the next slide, James. We'll point you back right here. So then the implications. You're divided. Therefore, think about the Lord's suffering. And then there's these three things here. 
drink the cup, eat the bread and drink the cup in an unworthy manner. Don't want you to do that. So therefore examine yourselves and for those who eat and drink without discerning the body. This is in liturgy in church for generations. But what does unworthy mean? What does examining mean? And what does discerning the body mean? Traditionally, it plays out like this. Unworthy is somebody who is aware of sin in their lives, but they don't want to do anything about it. And then we take it as Paul's encouraging them to have a examine themselves, take a moment of private introspection, have a little bit of thought. Is there anything in my life which is unworthy? And therefore remember that Jesus' body was broken and that I can cast it onto him and I can be this very individual thing between me and Jesus. And that is beautiful. But contextually, that doesn't make much sense what's going on here. The context is the division in this community here in Florida. And in verse 33, which will come up soon, all simple encouragement, the whole end of this is simply eat together. There's problems with division. The solution is eat together. The reason is it because of the Lord's Supper. So the key thing is when it says that we need to discern the body of Christ, what does that mean? It isn't actually talking about discerning Christ's body, the bread. It's actually talking about discerning the body, the church. The language is different. If it's talking about the body and the blood, it would say the body and the blood. But in this case, the way it's phrased is solely talking about the body of Christ, which is the church. So an unworthy way of taking the Lord's Supper is in a way that you're not recognizing your brothers and sisters on the side. Completely different to how often we want to teach. And you can see this. You can see this in a church which is divided. Paul is saying, examine yourself. Think, am I causing division? Am I showing favoritism? Is there broken relationships in this community of God? Is there a need of forgiveness? Is there a need of confession? So when we take the Lord's Supper, we can be at one and we can proclaim the oneness that he has achieved. To me, it's beautiful. To me, this proclaims the gospel is for all, not just for some. This proclaims that the gospel is for the wealthy, but also for the poor. And no matter what our status, that's okay, but we can take it together. There's a quote which I might bring up. I'm going to bring up that quote. I'm going to read it out as well. The Lord's Supper is not just any meal. It is the meal in which at the common table with one loaf and a common cup, they proclaim that through the death of Christ, they were one body, the body of Christ. Here they must discern, recognize, distinct the one body of Christ of which they all are part and in which they are all gifts. And to fail to discern the body in this way by using those of lesser social uh, is to incur God's judgment. To me, this is a, a beautiful apologetic in today's world, a group where every single person is welcome. I actually can't think of really any other place where everyone is welcome. Even today in our public school system, not every child is welcome. If you've got a slight difficulty, you're sort of farmed out to another special child. There's not many things where everyone is welcome. The surf club is beautiful, but you do have to pass the fitness test. And so those who aren't able to pass that test are not welcome. Not in the surf club. There are many things, groups of people here and groups of people here. The church is one where we are all welcome to the table. But it's not based on what we bring or the wealth or the beauty or our skills or anything. It's based on what Christ has done. The kingdom of this world elevates power and beauty and wealth in a crazy ways. The kingdom of hell, heaven acknowledges these things, but keeps them actually in the light of scripture. The kingdom of heaven doesn't place these identity labels on people, but gives us the power to see through these boxes that we so often fall into and to remember that each person that we see, no matter how much or how little they have, is actually a person made in the image of God in need of God's grace with gifts that contribute to the church and to the world and can be key parts of his work. And so can I encourage you to fight to see past the gods, to fight to see past the games that people play and remember that each person that you deal with is just another human being. Whether there maybe there are people at work who walk around
around and they're intimidating and they have power. Remember, they are just the See past it. And be like Jesus, you could see past the rich young ruler and just relate to them and love them and just serve. I have a, a mate who, um, he actually passed away um, last year or early this year, I can't remember now, but his, his job was to sort of help churches start across the nation. And so his key part of his role was uh, networking and fundraising, and he was brilliant at it. And so I just go, tell me, how come everyone who I seem to meet knows you? And how do I know that so many people, and how do you raise just the funds that you raise? And, I, and he goes, it's simple, it's simple now. I just try and be a really, really good friend to all these people. I meet someone and I just hear their story. I remember their name. I remember their wife's name or their husband's name. I know how many kids they've got and I remember their kids' names. I call them up a couple of times a year just to check in to see how they're doing. I write letters when they're sick and I fly to meet them when needed for whatever reason. And he goes, he goes, none of these people, and most of the people in his Rolodex were pretty impressive. He goes, most of them don't have that. Most of them just have people who were trying to leverage it and get things out of them for whatever reason, good and bad. And a lot of them just tell, tell me that I'm the best. And so he goes, I've really just got the job, the ministry of being a friend. And the number of people he's led to the Lord or helped come back to the Lord or the amount of people who have given significant amount of money to good projects without being asked solely by this guy I know called Jay, who could just see past all the gloss and relate as a human to human being. I know that's what I want to be. I think that's, I know that's, I hope that's what you want to be. But we're also about to take the Lord's Supper. And as I said, a key part of the Lord's Supper is remembering what Christ has done, but it's also remembering that Christ has done that for all of us, and we are all one body in Him. And so, I just want to encourage you to take that time. Um, are you? Do you have leanings in your personality that lean to some people over others, and that's quite natural? But do you do that in an extent that causes division? Do you, in your mind, subtly in this room, have haves and have nots? Do you have people that maybe? that you need to apologise to in various things? Or are, is there things that you just need to confess which is marring the oneness of God's church? It's so easy to have these levels because the whole world is based on it. And I love the fact that I'm reminded each week that we come up here, the kids come up, the adults come up, Good and the ugly come up, not like or anything like that, but we are all welcome at the table. And so, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a little summer in a second. But what we're going to do is, I'm just going to give you a chance to examine yourself, but don't just do it in a, a deep introspection between you and God, do it thinking of what's on your left and right. Maybe you want to use this time to chat to someone. Maybe there's someone in this room who's actually been really beautiful to you and you just want to encourage them this time. It doesn't have to all be negative. Just acknowledging that person and go, I'm so glad you're here. And take a look at something together. Maybe there is someone you need to say sorry to. And what I want you to do is, I'm just, we're going to play a song. I'm just going to give you a little bit of time. Use this time, can I encourage you? Use this time to pray. Use this time to encourage each other. Use this time to confess your sins. So as we take it, Require the oneness that we have in the work of God's church. In a short bit of time, or like a and there is bread, and there is wine, and there is grape juice there. We will get it, and then we'll all take it together as one. So if we just have the music on, James, thinking, encouraging, praying.